Welcome to the Good News Only. My name is Tanya McIntyre, and I am passionate about positive media. After spending 22 years as a broadcast journalist, I reached a tipping point finally. That being immersed in negative news every day, as you can imagine, was just chipping away at my soul. I founded the Good News Only in 2010. I wanted there to be a resource for people to watch, read, and hear all the good things going on in the world and all the good people in the world. And as always, I have one of those good people joining us for this episode of The Good News Only. Tom Tikash is a VP with a top management consulting firm and an organizer with Direct Action Everywhere. Now, that's also known as DXE. DXE is a global network of animal rights activists working to end speciesism, which is the exploitation of others based on species. DXE uses tactics such as open rescue, pledging, and nonviolent protests, including disruptions, to challenge the use of animals for food, clothing, experimentation, and entertainment. Wow. That is quite an agenda. Tom, welcome to the Good News Only. Thank you for having me, Tanya. Pleased to be here. So, Tom, I had a little bit of a problem uh, pronouncing speciesism. It's a tricky one. It sure is. Uh, it's uh, speciesism. Speciesism. It's similar to sexism, racism, um, but speciesism is, as you said, uh, discrimination based on uh, one species. Interesting. And I love the tactics that uh, your organization uses. Open rescue, pledging, nonviolent protests, and including disruptions, which have been very effective. That's right. Yeah, I mean, we have been um, controversial in the animal rights world. Um, our form of nonviolent uh, direct action has uh, made us known for our disruptions. We do more than that, as you said in the intro. Uh, we do open rescue, we do pledging, and hopefully I'll have a chance to talk about that. Um, but we are kind of most famous for our disruptions. And uh, a disruption is um, something that we've seen in other social justice movements, and it's very new in the animal rights world. You most recently did something with uh, the Toronto rapper Drake. That's right. So locally here in Toronto, so I'm an organizer with DXC uh, in the Toronto chapter. Uh, we've got chapters all throughout the world, uh, but the Toronto chapter is the largest chapter in Canada by far. And uh, we've hit uh, social media and major media many times over the last 14 to 15 months, most recently just last weekend. So uh, the famous rapper Drake um, is co-branded and partnered with Canada Goose uh, to launch a Canada Goose jacket uh, with his logo on it. And uh, a lot of people may not realize that Canada Goose uh, kills one million coyotes per year uh, in lake hole traps. So they catch coyotes in lake hole traps where trappers then check their traps, find a coyote and many other animals they find. Uh, leg hole traps are banned in many countries around the world, including the European Union. And these animals suffer horrendously in leg hole traps, where they're then dispatched. These coyotes are skinned, and the fur of these coyotes are on Canada Goose jackets. So a disruption is when we do something um, in the public eye to denormalize the violence that we've become so used to uh, with animals. So we entered on the grand opening of Drake's store here in downtown Toronto on Dundas Street West uh, last weekend. We got in line with all the other customers, uh, about eight or nine activists. It doesn't take many people to create quite a disruption to catch the attention of media. About eight of us joined the line of the store. The store was only letting in two or three people at a time because uh, of the popularity of, of trying to get one of Drake's uh, famous Canada Goose jackets for $1,600. Wow. Once we all managed to get into the store, um, we then pull out signage. One of our, of our activists pulled out a leg hold trap and did a speak out in the store and demanded 
that Drake and his relationship with Canada Goose uh, told the world that Drake has blood on his hands for supporting this type of cruelty. And this is all captured on video. As you can imagine, customers and staff get quite shocked and upset when all of a sudden a disruption breaks out in their store. Of course. So that creates some tension. Mm -hmm. And uh, ultimately we are uh, ejected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then that video gets sent to media. And in this case, uh, Blog TO picked it up. And we had over 160,000 views in social media. And what we achieve is when Blog TO posts that, their website explodes with people having conversations about this. Mm -hmm. So now with you know very, very small budget of a couple of hours of our time and some paper signage, we have over 160,000 people talking about Canada Goose, talking about coyote, talking about fur, is it right, is it wrong? Mm -hmm. So that's what a disruption does. It wow. creates the space for people to talk about the issue. Opens up the dialogue, so important. Now, Tom, the objective of DXE, Direct Action Everywhere, is really to revolutionize public opinion on the whole issue of animal rights, and that can't be an easy task. That's right. I mean, if you think about the famous quote from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, he once wrote while in Birmingham jail, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And when we look back at history, and we look at um, going as far back as the American Constitution, uh, and when that, or the Declaration of Independence, when slavery uh, existed, and then we look to the Emancipation Proclamation, that was 87 years of history of slavery. We know when something deep down is wrong, and we know that slavery was wrong, and it took 87 years and a small group of people to start the conversation about ending it. When did, women's rights was a little faster. From about 1850, when the first small group of women came together at a conference at Seneca Falls in New York, and they formed the National American Women's Suffrage Association, to 1920, when the Constitution was amended, giving women the right to vote. And, and in my lifetime, I mean, it's shocking. I'll do one more example before I share my lifetime. We have the Civil Rights Movement, which was a very small period of time that within 15 years of the start of civil disobedience and protest and direct actions and sit-ins, we had the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed. So it took 15 years from the Montgomery bus boycott to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which banned discrimination based on race mm. and uh, gave fair housing, uh, banning discrimination uh, for housing and employment. And now in my lifetime as a gay man, I look at gay rights and I look at in only nine years, from 1968 to 1977, that's how long it took before Canada passed anti-discrimination laws, and in gay marriage, that is said to be as little as seven years it took from 1997 to 2004 for when gay marriage, the fight for gay marriage happened, and in Canada we have gay marriage. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the animal rights movement and I look at all the different isms that we fight, racism, sexism, and now we look at speciesism, is it so far of a leap that to hurt another being because they're furred, or thinned or feathered instead of being skinned, hmm. how far can it be to, to, to make that connection and end up discovering that, yes, we do discriminate based upon species, and it's not necessary? So there is actually something called the Species Equality Act. So that is the goal of the animal rights movement uh, very recently. Um, the old school animal rights movement, PETA, is probably famous as being one of the most known animal rights groups in the world. And they're not Direct Action Everywhere. Direct Action Everywhere, which is my group, focuses very much on an end goal of achieving, um, achieving an equality act in various countries that prevents people from hurting non-humans Groups like P 
PETA and Mercy for Animals might ultimately be trying to achieve that as well, but they don't publicly state that. You know, they, they talk about how we need to hurt animals less. Right, ethical treatment of animals. Hurt them mm -hmm. better. We need to get them out of cages and into cage-free. So our flag that we plant, our end goal, is boldly, uh, is boldly out there mm -hmm. and saying we're actually trying to eliminate ag animal agriculture. We're actually trying to protect all species from um, oppression. So that's a little bit different, and that's partially, um, I think, why, um, just like with um, the slave, slavery and women's rights, it's, we weren't treating our slaves better. We were getting rid of slavery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we weren't going to let our women go to work. We were going to make our women have equal rights to men. Uh, we weren't going to give gay people something like marriage. We ultimately gave them the exact same thing. Equality. That's right, mm -hmm. equality. Well, I was surprised to learn in my lifetime, uh, I did a story about uh, mentors in our lifetime that made a difference in our lives. And for me, it was a high school teacher in grade 10 geography, uh, Bernice McDonald. When I quit school in grade 10, she actually reach, uh, reached out to me and invited me to dinner to talk about, you know, life and what would face me as a high school dropout. So it's interesting that, uh, you know, when, when we, I think when we're with people of authority, it's different, I think, when they're not our parents. And for me, Bernice McDonald being my high school teacher, it really meant a lot that she took the time to spend time with me, just to have a conversation. She wasn't judgmental. She was just giving me some facts. And I was amazed to learn. So that was, let's see, in grade 10, I would have been 15. So that would have been 1975, Tom. She said that she was not allowed to get married and still be a school teacher as a female. <laughs> That's right. Can you imagine that in, 19, in the 1970s? Female school teachers had to remain single in order to be a school teacher. That, that just boggled my mind. It does. And even today, because as activists, direct action everywhere are filled with activists. And activists tend to make people uncomfortable. We do things in the public sphere to create attention, to force a conversation that people don't necessarily want to have. Exactly. Um, and that is what's required for social justice to be achieved in all of these various social justice movements. We have one woman in Toronto who was made famous by one of our actions, and she suffered the consequences because of that fame. So one of our most famous controversial disruptions was last year, and it was called the Dog Meat Please Challenge. Mm. And all of our chapters around the world participated in the Dog Meat Please Challenge, which was to enter a place that normalizes the violence against animals, which is typically a restaurant, and ask for dog meat hmm. and film the interaction. Wow. And when the interaction obviously comes to a logical conclusion, then activists pull out hidden signs and do a speak out to the restaurant patrons, and then they leave. Our action in Toronto was done at the Keg Mansion, the famous Keg Mansion, and our video went viral. We had over 400,000 views within 24 hours on Vegan Gains, who's a vegan bodybuilder, on his YouTube channel. And then it got picked up by newspapers and radio shows around the world. It got picked up in Australia, Israel, Germany, United States, and Canada. And the person, the woman that did the uh, kind of the acting part, asking for the dog meat, she's a school teacher. And she got pulled in and an old, old, dusted agreement between school teachers and their union dated in the 1930s said that school teachers have to represent the moral and values of the community. Ooh. And they said that her fighting for animals did not represent the values and morals of the community and showed a bad example and poor judgment. And hence the controversy of doing direct action for 
something that people don't necessarily believe is worth doing. Yikes. Now, you know, anytime people talk to me about moral majority, it makes my skin crawl. That's a, that's a dangerous line to toe, I think, when we're talking about moral authority and uh, the morals of a community. Who's to define that? <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, the golden rule tends to um, guide us. And it is a, it's timeless. It's in probably every religious text. So it seems to resonate with most people's hearts, which is, you know, don't do unto others as thou would not do to yourself. Give aid when you can give aid. Give love when you can give love. All of these things are kind of hardwired into most people. When people are really disconnected from that, we sometimes call them psychopaths and they're sometimes in prison. Mm -hmm. Um, Yet when we do this um, with animals in mind, then we're extremists, we're radicals, we're Mm -hmm. zealots. Right. Now, DXE's flagship campaign, it's actually entitled, It's Not Food, It's Violence. And it's now mobilized in 41 cities across 12 countries. And it seems to have had its greatest success, lately at least, in Israel. Sure. So that's an probably a stat from our 2014 material, so I'll give you a quick update on that, but the interesting part of Israel is, is still very relevant. So DXC has now operated in 150 cities in 30 countries. So wow. your stat's only a year old. Wow, yeah. So that in itself is incredible, that we've got um, people in Belarus and, and the strangest countries where I have to look them up on Google Maps and go, who did what? <laughs> where are we getting the translation services for that protest? So the campaign, It's Not Food, It's Violence, is, resonates. Um, we have definitely shaken up the animal rights world and mobilized vegans who before would be quiet vegans. They would be doing it the way they thought they were always supposed to do it, which was to be nice, Mm -hmm. um, make vegan cupcakes and show people how delicious (laughs) they are, um, and educate them on why we shouldn't hurt animals. And if we all do that, one day it'll come to an end. Mm -hmm. Israel has had an increase of over 15% in veganism in the last 12 months. And that's an unprecedented increase. Why is that? They are doing what other social justice movements have done, and they are doing what other social justice movements had as their foundation to make them successful. And that's what DXC tries to model itself under these historical social justice movements. And those are three things. Movement building, which requires community, So we need to have a really strong focus on community. And in Israel, Israel is interesting because Israel is not only a small country, they have a community because they're Jews. So they have a religious community. Mm -hmm. And when we look back at other social justice movements and we look at the communities that they had, um, social scientists like Nicholas Christakis and Duncan Watts have shown that these powerful communities were integral in the success of their social movements. And every single social justice movement was built on an existing community. So the LGBTQ rights movement, that was built around the gay and lesbian community centers. When I came to Toronto as a 16-year-old, I went to the 519 Community Center right away because that was the center of the gay movement in in. Toronto. Mm -hmm. And that's where the AIDS battle was fought, and that's where gay marriage was fought. And in the civil rights movement, the black church held um, community centers. Sorry, the black church held uh, those leaders, became the leaders of the civil rights movement, and everything was surrounded around the black church. Mm -hmm. And the women's suffrage movement was built around the women's clubs that they established. So the research tells us that Social values are spread via social networks and personal interactions. So your family and friends influence your political, your religious, and your personal beliefs more than anyone else. 
So that means to us that we need to instill anti-speciesism values into robust communities. So when you look at existing communities like Israel, where you've got a small country and you have a Jewish community, they've kind of got the check mark when it came to community. Mm -hmm. And in the animal rights movement in North America, we're using different techniques to build strong communities as opposed to uh, the old school, which is individual and uh, vegans doing individual outreach. We're not completely against that, but we're like, that's not what's required. Well, it's not effective. That first thing okay. of building community was key, and the second thing that Israel is doing is they're doing nonviolent direct action. Mm -hmm. They're doing exactly what all the other social movements do. They did, they're doing mass protests. They had the, the march that you might have saw the video of in 2014 was 1,000 people. The march they had this year, which is called the Earthlings March, was 10,000 people. Wow. The city of Toronto has the same march. It's called the March to Close All Slaughterhouses. Two years ago, three years ago, it was 100 or 200 people. Last year, I marched in it, and it was over 500 people. Mm -hmm. So that's what a year gives us you know, more than tr triple in size. Will the Toronto March this year, this summer, be 2,000 people? We're trying. Will mm -hmm. it be 10,000 people? We're trying. Mass protest is one major form of nonviolent direct action. Yes. VXC is famous for doing disruptions, which is another form of direct action. We haven't done some old school stuff like sit-ins. Um, we do stuff because of the, the modern day of social media allows us to do kind of dramatic stuff with smaller groups of people and get it onto the news and get people talking about it, which is what sit-ins ultimately did as well. Right. Well, the, the, and that's uh, that was my going to be my next question. How do we actually get ch culture to change? It seems to be a lot easier in this world of social media because, you know, it happens fast. It's driven by the majority vote in your social network. And that's demonstrated in Israel pretty much. With in Israel that. and in the Arab Spring. I mean, they, there's a saying that a single match can uh, a forest a light. So in today's modern social media days, uh, when you have uh, a community or a group of people that are sharing the same values, so in the Arab Spring a lot of it had to do with housing and jobs and young people and the Internet allowed them to mobilize that anger and uh, and collapse a government. Now, you know, we know the end story now. Historically, it didn't turn out so well, mm -hmm. but the movement did happen, and it toppled the government in, in faster than any movement has, has done anything yet. Our movement is a little more challenging because we're not fighting for ourselves. We're fighting for other species, and they're not the ones leading the fight. We are. Our personal interests are not as impacted as they were with women's right to vote, with um, the elimination of slavery, with um, gay marriage. These are all things that improve our lot. Um, so the fire, the match that lights the fire, um, is a little more challenging in the animal rights space, for sure. Yeah, undoubtedly. Uh, so we look at, we can't do everything through history, so we also look at modern social science. And we look at modern tactic, tactics that um, perhaps other movements haven't used yet. And one big one that we do, and we are the only group um, globally that does this, and that's open rescue. So that is another tactic that we do that is um, bringing the stories of these individuals to the public. So we're not showing the traditional investigation of um, someone getting hired at a farm, filming the abuse that is systemic, um, and then publishing the abuse. We're doing investigations, but we are taking out the victims, and we are sharing their stories. And we did that most recently and just released last week a investigation followed by an open rescue of a pig breeding farm where direct action everywhere activists went into a pig breeding farm and saw the conditions and those conditions as you can imagine um, are horrifying and this is the standard practice baby pigs are taken away from their mothers at 17 days of age well before they're weaned 
so that the mothers can be re-impregnated. Mm. The cycle continues. So animal agriculture, we know, destroys families by breaking the mother-child bond. We took out Madison, a baby pig, and today Madison is living on a sanctuary, healthy, happy, and free. And we published that story, and it was picked up in multiple newspapers. We have over 680,000 views of that video and the success of Saving Madison and telling her story from her perspective as to the life she would have led and now the life she leads. Wow, you needed to personalize it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Tom, if you got your wish and everyone went vegan tomorrow, what would happen to all the animals that are no longer needed? (laughs) (laughs) We've had that question before. No doubt. Um, And it, it would be the most wonderful, wonderful problem to have, wouldn't it? Um, it's, it's one of those, what if you were on a deserted island and there was only you and the pig um, on the deserted island? Would you ultimately eat the pig? <laughs> That's another question that we get a lot. But, I mean, the, the reality is, the real question is, we have 65 billion animals today every year that we slaughter unnecessarily because the science is in, kids. We don't have to eat them. We actually are healthier eating, the, eating what the pigs eat, eating what the chickens eat. Mm-hmm. Instead of having them eat the plants that they consume and make their muscles and their bones, we can eat those things and be healthier with lower cholesterol, lower blood sugar issues. We can save the planet. People forget we don't want to talk about animal agriculture and, and its damage to the environment, number one cause of deforestation of the Amazon, number one cause of climate change. We like to talk about um, cars and planes and shorter showers, but once again, the science is in. Mm-hmm. It's just not a popular story, so it doesn't make the news. All exactly. the scientists will, will, are lined up, and, they, and, and it's pretty damn clear, just like... Uh, the ones that say, yeah, climate change is real. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the problem doesn't exist today, unfortunately, where we have 65 billion animals we now got to take care of. Ultimately, we hope that people will stop exploiting animals and the industry will collapse. Um, So that's consumer behavior change. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's really going to do it. Um, What's really going to do it is when a small group of people make it happen. And that's Just like with gay marriage, we did not need 51% of Canadians to say, yeah, let's have gay marriage, and then the laws were passed. We had a small group of people convince the world that it was wrong to discriminate between loving people. Mm -hmm. And it did not take 51%. We didn't do a referendum in Canada to say 51% of people had to agree to that. No, just good people had to agree to it. Legislation, uh, policymakers had to agree. Companies made policies to prevent discrimination about uh, their gay people before laws changed. We need the city of Toronto to stop serving meat in daycares that are subsidized by our dollars. So we don't need every 51% of Toronto citizens to agree to that. We need enough people in the city of Toronto council to agree to that. We need Canadian government to stop serving meat in hospitals. We need to end the exploitation of animals and animal food, animal clothing through laws which require not 51%, it just requires good people to act. Yes, we need to convince people to vote with their wallets. That always affects change very quickly. Tom, what's the best way for people to learn more and or become involved in the animal rights movement? Yeah, so our website, www.directactioneverywhere.com, has um, our current campaigns, has our list of chapters to find a chapter near you. If you're interested in forming a chapter, we have a mentorship program, and that's just sending an email to mentoring at directactioneverywhere.com. In Toronto, we have our own Facebook group. Most chapters have their own Facebook group, so our Facebook group is Direct Action Everywhere Toronto on Facebook. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here on the Good News Only. Tom, keep up the great work. Thank you, Tanya. 
As always, I encourage everyone to take the diet that really works, a media fast. Ignore the news and improve your views. Don't watch, read, or listen to news and see how much your life improves. I'm Tanya McIntyre. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, I leave you with my wish to live well, laugh often, love always, and of course, stay positive. Oh,